Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. so kind to me Oh, the overwhelming never-ending reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down fights till I found leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve Still your love far from me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worth You paid it all for me You have been No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't.
All right, guys. Today I want to start with a, a, a quiz or maybe a game. Maybe you can participate. I, I want you to show this next slide here, and then um, and just this is these five names, right? This is the top five most follow people on the planet on Twitter. Now. Uh, uh, the, the, the top five people who has the most followers on Twitter. Can you kind of take a guess? Let's start from number five. Who do you think is number five most follow person on Twitter on the planet? Bieber. Who? Bieber? Anyone? Obama? No. Number five is actually Taylor Swift. Anyone want to take a guess of who's the number four? Obama. Somebody says Obama. Katy Perry. No. There's only five guys. Keep guessing. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Rihanna. Okay, there you go. Number three. Number three. Obama. Yes, number three is Obama. Number two. Now we got a lot. Two left. Number two is Justin Bieber, and the number one is Katy Perry. Katy Perry with one hundred and seven million people. Justin Bieber with one hundred and four people. Uh, Barack Obama is one one hundred and two. Uh, I mean, not uh, millions. One hundred and four millions. One hundred and two millions. Rihanna eighty seven. Uh, uh, Taylor Swift eighty three million people. Right. That's the most important information of this message, by the way. <laughs> Hey, we gotta admit it, right? With this technology and social media age, um, I, I think we are forced, or, or we have, we are forced to redefine the term friend, right? It's 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 now. When I was growing up, with some of you too, uh, when you're growing up, the definition of friend is basically the one that we see each other very often, the one that we hang out, play together, right? Or even we can come by or we can come over to their house uh, unannounced, right? Well, we can just show up in their house, right? That's the definition of friend, right? But nowadays, with the social media and all of that, right, the definition of friends, we, we, we got to admit it, it's changing, right? It changed, right? I mean, I mean, we, uh, someone that we barely know, someone that sometimes that we never even met, we call them friends, right? As a matter of fact, if, if you are a Facebook user, on, uh, there's a little section there that, that tell you how many friends you have, right? How many of you use Facebook? Yeah, yep. There's this little section that tell you how many friends you have, and then when somebody uh, this, when somebody wants to be your friend, they just send you that friend request. Now, recently I, I was I was reading this statistic, and it's shocking to me. There, there's a study that in this country, I don't know about any other country in, in other other part of the world, but in America, right? The average American Facebook users have about 338 Facebook friends. Now, I know some of you are more popular than the average American, right? You got, you have like Michael Page 1, Michael Page 2, Michael Page 3, right? You, you have so many fans that you have three pages of Facebook, right? But, but, but this is just the study about the average American Facebook users. They have about 338 friends on Facebook. But check this out. On the other study, on another study, they asked this question, hey, how many friends that you actually have in your real life? How many close friends? And the average American say they only have two close friends. Can you see that gap? 300 something friends on Facebook, but in real life it's only two close friends. And then another study says this, that 25% of American today, 25% of American today have zero close friends. Man, hashtag, the struggle is real, right? No, 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 just one more thing. How many of you want to confess? This is the confession time. Uh, let, let's confess together. My hands is up on this too, right? How many of you, how many of you, the reason why, like how many of you have no idea uh, in terms of the birthday of the people around you, 
right? The only reason why you know their birthday is pop because they pop up on Facebook, right? No, no, I think when it comes to technology, we have this love-hate relationship. Why do I call a love-hate relationship? It's because, you know, we got to admit it, it, it makes our communication better, right? We, we get connected better, right? I remember when I first came to the United States 20 years ago, 1997, I came here alone as an exchange student. In order for me to call my mom and my dad back in Indonesia, it cost me $2.50 a minute. A minute. So if I want to talk to them for 10 minutes, it's like $25. If I want to talk to them uh, for half an hour, that's like $75. And today, there are so many platforms and applications that we use. It's free. And we can get connected. We can talk to the people on the other side of the world. Right? For free. This is why I say it's a love-hate relationship. It's good on one side, but on the other side, if you really, really want to admit it, you know it's just not the same, isn't it? Communicating with someone online, uh, communicating with someone in chatting room, it's just not the same with just like getting together, face-to-face -to -face meeting, or actually the thing that we're going to talk about today, it's, it's not the same as having a real community. Don't you guys agree with that? Isn't it weird, right? Today, in today's world, we are busy, but we are bored. Do you know what I mean? We are busy, but we are bored. Like, we don't have anything to do, right? We are really, really bored, but we are busy scrolling down the phone, right? Editing picture, checking out what's going on with our friends, right? We don't have it. We are bored, but, but, but again, we're busy, right? And some of you stalking your exes, right, on Facebook, right? We are full, but we are empty. We are connected, but we are lonelier than ever. We know a lot of people. We interact a lot with so many people on, 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 online, right? But we have no one in our real life. This is why today I want to talk to you. If you want the title of today's message, I want to talk to you about this message called Better Together. Subtitle, The Importance of Community. Now, I want you to think about it. For those of you who don't know, a Jesus, who is God, came into this world in a human form, right? And he came to this world with a mission. And check this out. He could have done everything. He could have fulfilled his mission. He could have done everything on his own. But he didn't do that. He chose not to do that. He could have walking around healing people on his own, teaching, doing miracles, showing people that he is God, right? He could have done all of those things on his own, but he chose not to do that. Instead, he wants to model it to you and me, the importance of community. How you and me cannot live this life alone because we need people and we need community in our life. This is why Jesus chose 12 of his closest disciples to just basically go everywhere he goes, right? Just basically doing life together. Because again, let me repeat this. Jesus wants to model it to us. Jesus wants to give us example. This is what it means to live in community. Not in isolation, not alone, but in community. Now for the next few minutes of our time together, I want to share with you the three reasons why God wants you to be in community. The three reasons why God wants you to be in community. Number one, when I say community, I'm talking about this Sunday group, uh, this Sunday uh, community that you come every week, right? I'm talking about when you meet in the middle of the week with, with your friends in, in life group, in small group. I'm talking about the friendship that you have with other believers. You hang out at the coffee shop, just talking about life and talking about how God works in your life. That's what I mean by community. The meeting that you meet together, right? Not once in a while, not when you feel like it, but it's actually consistently 
frequently and intentionally. That's what I mean by community. Three reasons why God wants you to live in community. Number one, so that we can obey God's command. So that we can obey God's command. There are things that God wants us to do that we cannot do unless we are in community. I'll explain to you in just one moment. In the New Testament, in your Bible, right, it's divided into two sections. One is the Old Testament, meaning before Jesus was born into this world. And another one is the New Testament, after Jesus was born into this world. Now, in the New Testament, they are full, in the Scripture, in the New Testament, they are full of commands to one another, one another. In other words, they're full of command. hey, you got to do this to one another, you got to do this to each other. Right? I uh, show. Can you show the picture, the list of it? The example is this: encourage one another, live in uh, live in peace with one another, show hospitality to one another, teach one another, love one another, live in harmony with one another, be devoted to one another. There are about fifty nine, five nine, fifty nine commands to one anothering one another. Do you realize that, that the word one another cannot be done unless you have a community? Are, are you, do you know what I mean, guys? Yeah. The, like, the, the word one another cannot be applied, cannot be practiced if we live alone. If we don't have, if we live in isolation. The word one another in one another can only be done if you are in community. Now, here's what, I, here's what I want to tell you. This is not like God's command, well, God wants you to do this so that, so that this, because this is the requirement for you to go to heaven. No, no, it's not like that. The reason why God wants you to practice this so that God can give you the fullness of life. You want to experience the fullness of life? This is what you got to practice, Jesus said. You want to know what it means to have an abundance life? You got to practice this. But one of the main reasons, I think, why God wants us to practice one another in one another is this reason. So that we, as a church, we as a group of people, can display to the world, can give example to the world, how we treat one another. I think that's one of the main reasons. This is why God wants you to obey His command to one another, in one another, to live in community, so that we can be the example for the, the rest of the world. This is how we're supposed to treat one another. The church in the first century started in community, and it continued to grow in community. Hey, do you know the term Christian? The term Christian in the Bible is only mentioned three times. Do you guys know that? Right? In other words, people back then, the Christian, Jesus follower, they don't call themselves Christian. Like, like us today, we call, oh, I'm a Christian, right? But back then, Christian is the term that the outsider used to describe a group of Jesus followers. So, 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 so a group of Jesus followers, right, the way they love one another, the way they live at, in peace with one another, and the outsider looking at those groups, and they go like, wow, who are those people? Oh, let's call them Christian. So that's, what, that's, that's, that's how the word Christian uh, started. The example of this would be like this. If you see a group of people who love reading books, right, who just devour books after books, and you go like, oh, that's a group of bookworms. Yeah? yeah? You see people who's good at like technology, oh, that's a group of geeks, right? We are from the outside, they'll just, just kind of like call them and call them. This is the same. The outsider call a group of Jesus followers because the way they treat one another, and they call them, wow, let's call them Christian, Christ followers. And without they realizing, right, they actually fulfilling what Jesus asked them to do. They're actually practicing what Jesus asked them to do because Jesus says this to them. So now I'm giving you a new command. Love each other as I have loved you. I have a different thought. Saying, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said. 
How do we love one another? Well, like I love you, Jesus said. How, 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 how did Jesus love us? Well, he died for us. Sacrificial love. That's what he's talking about. Right? That's what you got. When you treat one another, it has to be some type of sacrifice. Sacrificing your time, what you have, and uh, sacrificing our pride. Right? Right? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple. If you love one another. So the reason why Jesus wants you to be in community so that you and me can be the example to the rest of the world. Oh, this is how we treat one another. This is how we're supposed to treat one another. And people will know that you are Jesus' followers, not by the way you, you pray, not the, how good you are in memorizing Bible first, although all of those things are very important, not the way you sing, right? But the way we love one another. So that's the first one. The reason why God wants us to live in community so that we can obey His command to one anothering one another. Are you still with me, church? Yeah, one person, good. Number two, the reason why God wants you to be in community is that so we can experience the growth that he wants us to experience. So that he, we, we, can, we can grow as an individual. We can grow as a person. There is growth that can only happen when you are in community. There is no other way. There, is, there, are only, there are growths that can only happen if you are plugged in into community. There is this verse in Hebrew. I'll explain to you in just one moment. It says this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us think of ways. Let's find ways so that we can motivate each other. So that we can uh, uh, treat each other well, right? And then the next one, it says that let us not neglect our meeting together. Stop coming to the meeting together. You know, and don't stop coming to the, to the, to the community. Don't, don't stop living your life plugging in the community. As some people do, it says. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return, Jesus' return, is drawing near. Let's not neglect. Don't ignore our meeting together because it is very important. Can I give you a little bit of background of, of the, the book of Hebrew? The book of Hebrew is written about 65 AD. So that's about 30 years after Jesus was crucified and the church was born, right? But here's the problem. Jesus' followers at the time, they were persecuted like crazy. I mean, if, if the Roman uh, knows that, that you are Christian, they will kill you. They will feed you to lions. They will burn you alive. They will crucify you. They will kill you. So they experienced this persecution. And in the middle of that persecution... There are some people who gave up. Ah, oh, you know what? It's not worth it following Jesus. There are some people, especially a group of Jews, who kind of like go back to their old religion. Go back to their old habit. Or go back, if you will, to the old life. This is why the author of the book of Hebrew, he felt, whoever wrote that, he felt the need to encourage the people. This is why he said, hey, let's motivate each other. Let's encourage one another. Don't ignore and don't neglect our meeting together. Don't stop being in the community. Why? Because we are stronger when we are together. That's what the author says. Now, if I can use this picture in the first, from the first century and translate it to today's life, to your life and my life, we might not experience the same type of persecution like they were, right? I mean, we, we get to go to church, we get to worship God anytime we want, and we have a lot of freedom. We are not being persecuted like them. But this is what I understand, that all of us, we are facing with some type of struggles, right? We are facing with some type of problems, discouragement, right? Right? Things in your life, 
you know, they do not go according to what you plan. Or, or some of you, you're just exhausted. You're just tired with the busyness of life, right? And, and you are thinking, when is this going to end? When, I'm, when am I going to experience breakthrough? This cycle of this busyness is just really crazy in my life. And when all of those happen, now this is natural, this is not just some people, but this is, I think, this is a, a natural reaction in, in, in all of us. Our tendency when things don't go well, when we experience all type of problem in our life, that we withdrew from people. We like being alone, right? We, we, we withdrew from community. We just want to be alone. And some of us, we have the habit of self-pitying ourselves, right? We feel sorry about ourselves, right? And I just want to say that's normal if you want to withdraw from people and be alone. But here's what I want to say to you. Don't do that for too long, right? Just do that for the weekend, one or two days, a week maybe. But don't, do, don't be alone, alone for a long time. This is why, the, again, let's not neglect our meeting together. Let's come together no matter what you're facing and so that we can motivate one another. We can encourage one another so that you can move forward in this life. So that you can grow from that problem that you are facing. There are growth in our life that we cannot get unless we are plugged in in the community. I want you to think about this for a moment. Think about your life. In one week frame, okay? Think about your life or, or last week or maybe this coming week. Think about your life in one week uh, uh, time. Okay? Now, here's some question for you. How many hours of that one week that you use, first of all, for sleep or sleeping? How many hours of those one week that you used to go uh, for, for school and work and some of you school and work, Right? How many hours of that one week that you spend in front of the screen, TV, cell phone, uh, Netflix, or all of those, right? And then, out of that one week, think about all of those hours that you do just, just to have fun, hanging out with friends, right? Or some of you doing laundry, right? Now, here's the question. How many hours of that one week, the activities that you do, that actually connected with your faith, that actually connected, that has something to do with growing your faith. Do you know, do you understand my question, right? Out of that one week of your time, how many of those activities or how many hours do you spend that actually that you use for growing your faith, right? Here, here's the point that I'm trying to make. We are living in this world or we are, we are around people who don't really pay attention or who are careless about faith. And we are around those people all the time, right? We are living in the culture where they don't encourage you to grow in faith. So my question is, where else do you actually have a conversation about faith? If it's not in the community like this, Sunday morning, in the middle of the week, small group, youth gathering, right? Meeting up at the coffee shop, shop, like I said earlier, so that we can help each other in life, right? Think about what we can do to get better as a church so that we can serve more people. Let's not neglect our meeting together because, again, there are some growth that you and me cannot experience unless you are plugged in into the community. Another question for you, those of you who are considered veteran Christian, meaning that you've been a Christian for a long time, uh, you're born as a Christian, you've been going to church for your whole life, right? I want to ask you guys a question. Those of you who've been a Christian for a long time, have you ever heard someone who's growing in faith, but in isolation, but alone? Have you ever heard that story? All of a sudden you meet someone, right? You are so inspired by their faith and their journey with God. And you are so inspired by, by their faith. 
And then later on you find that, oh, the reason why he had that kind of faith is because he was just alone all the time. Have you ever met that kind of person? Have you ever met someone like that? Better in Christian, the, the, the answer probably no. Most likely no. But let me tell you what I hear all the time. Somebody say, my faith grows because someone invited me to church. My faith grow because someone just uh, invited me to, 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 to his house. And apparently in their house every Wednesday, every Thursday, every Friday, they have what they call the small group or live group, right? Or oh, someone invited me to come to a youth group. That's what I hear all the time about someone who, who are growing in faith. Or, or maybe someone says, well, I, I work for someone. And I found out that my boss is a Christian. And then he started taking me under his wings. He invested a lot of time in me. And that's how grow he was being patient with me. Right? That's what we hear all the time. There are some growth that cannot happen unless you are plugged in to community. So here's the application part. Here's the do part. Right? Don't do life alone. Now, here's what I think a lot of us... Instead of, uh, and this is, you can apply this right away, instead of, instead of going around looking for the perfect group of people, instead of looking around for the perfect community, right? Instead of going around looking for the perfect church, I was just thinking maybe, just maybe, the reason why God has those people around you, the reason why you are surrounded with that kind of people that you are surrounded right now, because God wants you to learn to embrace them so that you can grow. So God wants you to learn so that you can accept them the way they are. Right? Instead of getting angry and living because someone says something hurtful to you, someone treated you not, not good, right? Why don't we practice forgiveness? Instead of moving from one group of people, oh, I don't like them, you know, because they do something to me. Oh, they, I don't like them because they always talk about this and that. And move to another group. Why don't we learn to extend our grace like God has extended His great for, grace for us? In, instead of being mad and not and dissatisfied but because He didn't do this for me, right? Because He didn't do something for you. Why don't we ask, why don't we learn to give instead of asking, instead of thinking, what can they give me? But in, instead, why don't we learn to actually, what can I do for them? That's the kind of growth that God wants you to experience. So three reasons why God wants you to be in the community. First, so that you can obey His command to one another in one another. The second is so that you can... Uh, 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 grow there are some growth that you cannot experience outside community and here's the last one and i'm gonna uh, uh, uh let you go here's the last one this is very important and you like this word right this is your the favorite christian words the miracles there are some miracles that god wants you to experience in community there are some miracles that can only happen if you are in community some of us, we are missing out the miracles because we are not in the community. I want to share with you the, the first four books of the New Testament that they are, they are called the Gospel or the Good News. It's basically the autobiography of Jesus, right? So basically, there's four different writers who wrote the story about the life of Jesus. Now, there's, there's a few miracles that actually was written in all four. There's some miracle that you only found in one of the book, two of the book, but there are miracles that, that actually was written in four books of the gospel. And one of them is when Jesus fed the 5,000 men. I, we, we talked about this a couple weeks ago that uh, 5,000 people, that's, they're, that's, the, they were all, that's, that's only men, right? But with, with the uh, women and children, it's totally about fifteen to 20,000 people. And Jesus fed them all with only five bread and two fishes. That was a, a, one of the most well-known miracles. But in one of the book, Luke, who is a historian and he was a doctor, he was, he, he was mentioning something that I think is very interesting. Right? One time, this, this crowd, was uh, the disciple would go like, 
hey, Jesus, I think we should, we should send them home, right? This is getting late, and you've been teaching all day. And Jesus said, well, before we send them home, let's, let's feed them. Well, we don't have food. We only have five bread and two fishes. Well, it's okay. Here, just start to distribute the food, and I'll make the miracles. But Jesus says something like this before the disciple actually distribute the food. Then Jesus told the disciple to have people. Can you help me out, guys? On the green grass. Split them up into groups. Right? And in that groups, they experience that miracles. There are some miracles that you and me will not experience unless you are in groups, in community. There are miracles of healing that you and me will not experience unless you are in community. Healing from sickness healing from depression, healing from, uh, healing from anger issue, healing, healing from bondage, he healing from depression and anxiety. There are some miracles of healing that you can only experience if you are in groups. James 5 verse 16 says, Confess your sins to each other. There you go. To each other. One another. Again. Pray for each other so that you... Maybe heal. The earnest prayer of righteous person have a great power and produce wonderful result. Confess your sin to each other. Pray for one another. Then you will be healed. I share with you guys so many times about how I, I was addicted to pornography for 25 years. 25 years. It wasn't until I plug in into the community and I share about my struggle, about my addiction, and they started to pray for me. They started to motivate me. They started to encourage me until I'm set free today. And now, since I was, I was a youth pastor until today, so many people come to me and, and share about their struggles, right? They would share about with me about their, their addiction, their, 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 their addiction, their problem with pornography and all that, right? And I told them, this is what I told them every single time. If you ask for forgiveness from God a thousand times, God will forgive you a thousand and one time. But the question that I always ask them, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be set free? Because if you just want God to forgive you, He will forgive you. But if you really want to be healed and set free, that's it. Confess your sin to each other and pray for each other. I hope you have someone who cares enough for you that they will pray for you. Be in the community. Be in the community that they will allow you to be transparent and they will not judge you. Praying for you and checking on you. I know it's 10.30, but can I close with this? I have one story that I want to tell you. And this is the reason why I wake up every single morning and I love what I do. Earlier this year, we have one of our friends, uh, one of our uh, leaders in this church, uh, Daniel. Uh, he got married in, in December and then he, he, he moved to a new apartment. Uh, and then when, when he moved... Uh, with, with Monica, his wife, and when they moved to the new apartment, they live on the first floor, right? And on the second floor, there is someone, there's a guy named Jose, some of you remember, because in a few months that he was here, he actually uh, served in the music team. And Daniel started to talk to them and started to invite him uh, to church, right? And he came, he came. And then again, like I said, he started helping out in the music team. Um, during the few months that he was here, um, I, don't, I don't get a chance to uh, spend a lot of time with him. But thankfully, there, 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 there's a group of people who, who, who don't say that, hey, you know what, let's just wait for Sam, right? No, there's a group of people who decided, you know what, let's include him into our small group let's include him into our community so so i only get to spend a, a, a just 
actually one time going out with him, we went to the game, we went to the Sixers game, uh, on the right side there, um, Jose is, 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 is the one, that, the biggest one in the, in the, in the picture there, he's the tallest one. And in, in my one time going out with him, he shared with me just a little bit about the reason why he moved to Philly. Because uh, first, the reason he because he was uh, his his girlfriend, and then uh, unfortunately the relationship didn't work out, and they broke up, and it really really crushed him, really crushed him. Now, uh, th so that's all I know about him. But but anyway, just. Uh, starting a, a couple months ago, he started getting really busy, right? He, 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 he didn't have time to come to church again. And, and at one time, he was sent to Mexico, I believe, uh, for work, and he was there for a month. And then a couple months ago, he actually uh, moved out from Philly for good. Now, here's the story that I want to tell you. On the last night, that picture on the left there, that's the... On the last night that he actually get together with his life group, with his community, which I'm not part of that. Daniel was leading it. Hansel was leading it. Right? They, the, that, that small group uh, took him uh, to dinner, and he, he uh, and they, they wrote him a card, right? Just kind of like farewell, I'll see you, right? And then after that dinner, everybody went home, and he shot a message, Jose San Santana. There. He shot a message to the, again, to the web WhatsApp group where I'm not part of, but it's, it's their group. This is what he said. I'm going to miss you guys. Thank you so much for the card. It means a lot. And, and this is the part. This is my favorite part. I was a stranger. But you guys welcomed me with open arms. I was a stranger. Man, I was in this, the, the most difficult season in my life after I broke up with my girlfriend. But there's a group of people who thankfully decided, hey, you know what, we, we're not waiting for you. you know, we're going to include him in our group. And you guys welcome me with open arms. Although he was busy with work and he couldn't come to church on Sunday, but he came often to that small group that they do on Wednesday. Now here's just here's what I want to talk to. Uh, here's just I want to tell you. Can you imagine this for a moment? What if every single one of us? Let's not talking about the people who is not in this room, but just us, us here. How many? 20, 30, 40 people here. What if just us, right? We take responsibility in creating community. I mean, I mean, if every single one of us uh, take a responsibility in creating communities, I mean, can, can I, how many of these kind of stories that we're going to hear? Can you imagine if every single one of us, right, stop thinking about and stop waiting and stop thinking about what other people can do for me, what is this church can do for me, but instead, we are being the church, Instead, we ask, what can I do for others? How can I create a community or a place for others? How can I be better in one anothering one another? I mean, if we do that, how many lonely people in the next couple of months that will say, I'm not alone anymore, I have community? How many depressed Anxious, stressed, broken-hearted people who will say, I experience healing because I'm not alone, because someone prayed for me, because my group prayed for me. How many people who are lost who can say that I am safe now? Come on. If you are alone, don't do life alone. But here's what I want to say. If you are fortunate enough to have a group of people, a community, would you kind of open the door for two or three more people to join your community? Would you kind of include them in your community? Don't close your circle. Invite someone from the outside to be part of your circle. Man, I was a stranger, but you guys welcomed me with open arms.
Let me pray for all of us.